All right, joining me for this episode is our second Air Force Colonel on the channel. We had Casey Campbell on uh, a few months ago. Merrill, I don't know if you saw that episode. So you are our second Air Force Colonel, um, our first U-2 driver, um, but your career path has been nutty. So we'll get to that in a second. So let's welcome Colonel Merrill Tengestall. Merrill, welcome to the channel. Thank you so much, Mooch. Thank you for having me here. So let's talk about your career path, because as I said in the outset, it's it's unorthodox with a capital U. So you're born and raised in the Bronx? Grew up in the Bronx, um, seven years old, had this passion from watching too much science fiction to be an astronaut. And that started uh, my journey to wanting to become an astronaut. So uh, everything I did at that point was to inform or give me the tools necessary to become an astronaut. Cause I looked at Star Trek as the blueprint. Uh, for me, if you went to Starfleet Academy, oh, made sense, go to college. You know, if you know you have the science officer and everyone in space, oh, do math and science, be good at it, whether you are or not, just study. And then um, I wanted to be like Chekhov and Sulu. So I was like, I, I wanna fly. So commercial aviation or military. Um, it is cost effective to do military um, aviation coming from the Bronx. So I started looking at what path I wanted to uh, do. And time and time again, with a little bit of research at uh, Pensacola, I wanted to become a naval aviator. So that was uh, that's where all my focus went. Hey, before we get going here, let me talk to you real quick about something that's frustrating me, because I'm sure it's frustrating you, too. And that is the current digital media landscape. Things like manipulative algorithms and media bias and echo chambers and clickbait. Well, now there's a way to fight those things and get closer to the truth. And it's called ground news. By threading multiple perspectives from thousands of publications through one reliable platform, ground news frees readers from algorithmic restraints, illuminates blind spots, and makes media bias explicit. Ground News compares more than 60,000 news sources to give you a macro view of how a story is being framed and where sources fall on the political spectrum. Ground News also lets you follow the money by teeing up a breakdown that shows ownership data of news sources. And Ground News offers a My News Bias section, a personalized dashboard with helpful tools to track your reading habits and avoid echo chambers. To take advantage of any one of Ground News's three plans, Pro, Premium, and Vantage, tailored to your news reading habits, Click on the link in the episode description below and also pin to the top of the comments. You wind up doing primary, the usual airplanes, T-34, Charlies, get helo selection, go through the requisite pipeline there, get your wings, and wind up getting SH-60 Bravos out of Mayport. So talk to us about your first squadron experience and what it was like to fly the SH-60 Bravo. Uh, it was amazing. Um, that was the helicopter I wanted coming out. H-60s were coming on board. H-3s were phasing out. So I wanted to be on the East Coast to be closer to my mom. Um, I did pretty well. And quite frankly, the H-60 for me is because there were weapons on it. We had sauna buoys, we had torpedoes. Uh, at that time, Penguin missile, uh, we had one. We had Hellfire missile. We had FLIR. So I love the tactical aspect of that you were basically a plug-and-play system. You just had to know a lot of systems. And you had to be familiar with, you know, anti-submarine warfare, search and rescue. So I love that aspect of the H-60 and flying that aircraft was just amazing. On the back of the boat, uh, my first deployment was with the GW Battle Group. So, I mean, it was just, for me, it was bomb. Like a lot of a lot of aviators in the Navy are helicopter pilots, but I loved the mission of that. I loved every day it was different. Did you ever have any noteworthy pitching deck situations and, and other challenging landing on the small flight deck uh, ops kind of stuff? Those things are squirrely, especially if you have a C-state of four or five, it could get, you know, it, you know, strap in, it's about to get a little wild. We fixed wing types like to judge you rotary wing types, but uh, <laughs> we got nothing on you with that kind of uh, action right there. So you finish your first fleet tour, shore duty, you wind up being a flight instructor, flying T-6s at Moody. Talk to us yeah. about that tour. Uh, it was um, it was a great tour. So the first part, we went to do instructor training in the T-34 to get T-34 qualified and fly with students. Then we uh, 
it was four Navy instructors that got selected for this program. So this was at a time when the Navy and the Air Force jointly bought the T-6 aircraft, the T-6 Texan II. I was one of the four that were selected. We went out to Corpus Christi. We got our instructor certification for the T-34, went to Randolph Air Force Base, went through like an operational test of their courseware system. And then we went through a, what's called a modified PIT. And in the Air Force, that means um, pilot instructor training program. So we went there and flew the T-6 at Randolph Air Force Base. Once we were certified, we went out to Moody Air Force Base and flew with Navy and Air Force students for three years. So I would say as a Navy person getting immersed in the Air Force culture, it was a little eye-opening and it was, I mean, it was just different. It was uh, something that I was interested in doing to begin with. I always wanted to see how sister services operated. For me, more tools to put in my tool belt for later on. For what? I don't know. I just wanted to learn and learn a different perspective. So look, I was a Navy lieutenant in an Air Force base, not having to follow a lot of Air Force rules, but instructing students. And it was it was a great time. I definitely learned that there is a difference between the way Air Force pilots come out and Navy pilots come out. And neither one is good or bad. It's just different. It's just a different way of looking at things, a different uh, mindset. That perspective served you well when you made this. Again, I've never heard of this happening before. So you did a very unorthodox pivot. So your Navy obligation is is over. So you had options and you chose um, to become a, an Air Force U-2 pilot. Now, help us out. How the heck did that happen? I was working for one of my bosses and he said, hey, come over to the Air Force. You're getting out. Come fly with us. And I said, huh. All right. Well, that sounds intriguing. So I looked into some of the programs and the U-2 was one of those programs. You have the B-52, you had the B-2, you had the F-117 at the time that was available. And there's certain criteria for the U-2 program. There's an actual inter interview process that you can apply to. It's on their website at Beale Air Force Base. So once I got picked up for an interview, um, I went out there to apply. And it's a two-week interview process. The first week you talk to the commanders, you get an idea of the, the students and the pilots that are there because it's, such, it's so small knit. To this day, there's about a little over 1,100 pilots in the 67 years. They want to know who you are. So if you have to deploy together, you're not choking each other out. So, you know, you get to learn about each other. And then the second week is when, if you make it past the first week of interviews, they say, hey, we want you to try the fly in the U-2. And you have three flights to prove how well and how trainable you are. If you do well, they'll ask, they'll ask, they'll hire you on. Um, if you don't, they say thank you, but no thanks. So at that time when I applied, I think about 50% of the applicants got accepted for an interview. And of that, about 50% of the people who interviewed got hired on or had the option to. This again is where your hybrid background served you well. And your choice of shore duty was smart because you had now a uh, pretty significant fixed wing hours. You weren't just a helicopter pilot. You you had flown the T-34 and the T-6. Did that help you in the selection process? It did. It, uh, you know, when I left the H-60 community, it was very hard to go back to fixed wing. Usually once you're in the helicopter community, they try to keep you there. And I actually, my backup plan, I had already been offered to go to the RAG and be a RAG instructor or the FRS, I think they call it now. So when this job and this opportunity came, um, as much as I love helicopters, you know, fixed wing is, is equally as fun, you know, flying in a T6 and T34 fully aero, aerobatic aircraft. I mean, that's, that's a good time. So the U2 is very specific about airspeed and altitude and the numbers that you fly, um, especially in particular for a no flap landing in the U2. Because for every knot that you're off in the U-2, that could be another thousand feet down the runway that you float. Being in the T-6, that gave me the opportunity and the, you know, um, the liberty as an instructor to go fly solo and, and spend an hour and a half flying very precise approaches. And um, 
just honing those skills in preparation for the U2. So you're already a winged aviator. Did you go yes. right to Beale into whatever their, they call their rag? Did you go right into the U2 training pipeline or did you have to do some Air Force basic flight school before you did that? No, I, I went straight to Beale. And the first thing we fly at Beale, um, we fly the T-38. So the T-38 is a companion trainer for the U-2. So I've, I've done an episode about Area 51, which <laughs> was actually created to develop, do the test and evaluation for the U-2 back in the mid-50s. Yes. Because you know, people always want to talk about aliens and you know, all of the other stuff that happens at Area 51, but it yes. was actually created first for the U-2 and then subsequent to the U-2 for the A-12, which became the SR-71, as we know. Um, so I entreat the viewers to check out that episode if they haven't seen it. But talk to us about um, what was challenging about learning how to fly this very specific airplane. It's a high altitude, long station, loiter type aircraft. It's subsonic so it doesn't go more than three quarters of a mach and um you know it's designed to stay on as go as high as possible not burn a lot of fuel and just stay on station and just i always say be the angel in the sky just just watching just looking and so you have a pressure suit because of the high altitude if you're flying over fifty thousand feet for prolonged periods you're you have a pressure suit on to get oxygen into your body and to inflate your suit in case of cockpit depressurization. And the suit will keep your body at 35,000 feet. Now, when you say that, I'm thinking of Top Gun Maverick when he's doing <laughs> the, the dark star and, and he's on the treadmill and he's breathing the oxygen. And did you have to oxygenate before you got in the airplane? So we, we used to call it exercise enhanced pre-breathing. And it's uh, things that NASA does too before they go out and uh, do spacewalks. The requirement for us is that you had to pre-breathe oxygen before takeoff one hour prior. You had to be in 100% oxygen one hour prior to takeoff. Get rid of the nitrogen out of your body because that's what's gonna cause decompression type sickness injuries, whether it's the chokes or neurological damage. It was very big for us back during the time I was flying the, the uh, U2 because a lot of people were coming back with uh, decompression sickness type injuries and it manifested it's like concussion type injuries so like i'd have a friend driving into work and we forget had to pull off to the side because he or she forgot where they were going or had one friend i would talk to who would forget words um to the worst case of some uh one guy um there was a class alpha mishap on him he almost crashed in between two uh two hangers um because he experienced decompression sickness it went away, he continued to fly, and then it came back and hit him neurologically. And it was a it was a huge thing uh, where he opened up at altitude, he got hypoxic, he threw up in his helmet. It it was pretty it was pretty bad. So I'm glad he's still with us today. He was able to land, but he collapsed on the yoke and went into circulatory collapse. So those are the physiological effects and the dangers of flying the U2. But that's what makes it compelling to me because again, I wanted to be an astronaut. So having my body go through that and being used to those type of situations is something, and the challenge of it is great. And now, so you take that and you're flying in this pressure suit and you're loitering, you're going out for nine, 10 hours and you're coming back to do a landing in this pressure suit with a yoke aircraft and you have to do a, a good landing so you're not breaking equipment or breaking the aircraft. I mean, it's, and the aircraft goes slow, but as slow as it goes, the amount of control input inside the aircraft, you'll see a U-2 pilot, the yoke is constantly moving. You're always putting these inputs in um, and you're constantly with the rudders, with the yoke to maintain, to land the aircraft with no drift or no crab. So it's, it's very intense and it requires a lot of precise movement. So the airplane, when it's dirty, when the gear are down, you have just two wheels along the fuselage, right? There's a nose wheel and then kind of a, I think what you'd call a skateboard wheel in the back. Uh, yes. Bicycle configuration. So main gear, tail wheel, and you're looking at, and 
I'm almost sure it's the main gear distance from the runway. So 10 feet all the way down to two, you're holding two feet off. So the aircraft, when it comes in, it lands because it's basically a tail dragger. If you landed it normally, you would just bounce off the main gear and then stall the aircraft higher. So what you want to do is you, as you're coming in, you want to land on the tail wheel first, stall it, land on the tail wheel first, and then come in. So you want to land slight, uh, slight tail wheel first, which is the preferred way. Then you're just rolling down the runway. Again, you don't, you don't no yaw, no crab. Correct. Straight down the runway, center line. Now talk to me about the outriggers. How does that go? So you have outrigger wheels called um, pogos. And those pogos are designed to help the aircraft taxi back and forth. On aircraft takeoff, they're actually pinned in. Before you take off, you have maintenance crews that come out, the pogo, pogo team. They remove... Uh, the pins in the pogo, as well as some other pins. You have the mobile do a last check around the aircraft, gives you a thumbs up. Now, as you're going down the runway and taking off aerodynamically, what do wings do as more airflow? They start to flex up just slightly. The aerodynamic forces, when they flex up, allow the pogos to drop. And once the pogos drop, they're there. Mobile will call them clear and you take off. And when you come back to land, you have to keep the wings off the runway. You can't teeter-totter back and forth. There are some um, strips, uh, titanium strips at the end of the wing tips to kind of protect the wing if one lands or another. But eventually you're going slow enough that one wing will drop depending on your fuel balance. You stop. The pogo crew comes in uh, once you're chocked and they will bring the wings up, put the pogos back in, pin them in, and then you go back to taxi. So obviously you have a flight schedule and there's an expected return time, but if you come back early, you're in comms with them so they can be out there to meet you. Well, one of the differences about the Air Force and Navy, you're always in comms with someone. So you're doing your mission. Your mobile is like your wingman on the ground. So if there's any problems that you have, especially if you're doing the mission, in most cases you can reach back or have um, the mission on scene commander, which is called the mock. If you're on uh, data link, you can get a hold of your mobile for any assistance. These are the guys that are going to help you for the checklist. These are the guys, that's the person that's pre-flighting your aircraft because you're not going to do that in the pressure suit. Um, they're, they're your wingmen. So if you have an emergency on takeoff, they're reading you know, your bold face or your procedures to you as you're executing uh, so they're doing that stuff for you. That's an important distinction. You do not pre-flight the airplane. You just go right from, you know, pre-oxygenating, getting the suit on, and then you just get in the airplane. So typical day is you'll go in, you'll you'll brief, you'll brief with your mobile. Then you'll go over to what's called physiological support. There is a whole squadron and a whole area of the Air Force that's dedicated just to physiological support. You go over there, what they do is... You get into the suit, they put you on 100% oxygen, they check your suit for the integrity of the suit, they check all your pressure switches because you have two switches that you could dial in pressure or hit another button, a push button to actually manually inflate your suit. Once they integrate you, they get your food that's required because we use tube, tube food um, as opposed to, because you can't open up once you're up at altitude. So you have tube food, which is basically, uh, pureed food like baby food that's in a tube that you put in you wait till it's your time to get to the aircraft in the meantime you have a mobile who's checking the forms for you for maintenance who's doing your walk around who's setting your cockpit up for you so once you get in because you gotta understand this suit is an additional 20 plus pounds that you're wearing even sitting in the aircraft itself and say i want to get to a circuit breaker way behind me. The amount of effort it takes for me for this bulky suit to actually reach back, I will start sweating if my environmentals are not correct. I mean it's 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 a lot of uh it's a lot of exertion. The reason why the U2 has a yoke in the cockpit is because if your suit inflates because of cockpit depressurization, the suit inflates where your hands are here. And to actually move past this inflation, it's 
it takes a lot of effort. I mean, you need to be in good physical physical condition to be able to do that. So, um, but if your hands are here for a yoke, if it was a stick, which is down a little lower, you can't, you can't grab it. You did all the post 9-11 stuff, enduring freedom, Iraqi freedom, Horn of Africa. So first off, how did the airplanes get to theater from Beale? Did you, did they take them apart and put them in C-17s or did you transplant or transpack how did you guys get into theater? So the latter. So um, flew aircraft in and out based on the maintenance schedule into theater. So when I flew an OEF and OIF, um, we flew out of uh, the UAE and we would transit to into, into theater and then we would conduct our missions and come back. So what was the nature of, in, in obviously the, some of this is very classified, but what, what was the nature of the missions that you did in theater? How would your tasking come in? What was the sort of, not that any day, any two days were alike, but what was the average hop uh, like? So the average hop for OEF or OIF was typically, you get an ATO and you would know what you're flying for that day. So again, when you're in theater, you're still bounded by the two hours and 15, maybe it's two and a half hours. You get an intel brief about what you're going to do, what kill box you're going to be in, what the purpose of the mission is. You brief, you go to PSD as normal, um, you gear up, your mobile goes out and does all the other pre-flight stuff for you. If there's a delay, they'll let you know. When you're in the desert doing stuff, um, heat is definitely a factor for the U-2. The moment they take air off the aircraft and you close that canopy, if you didn't take off within probably 15 minutes, you were going to overheat something. So it was very critical that we would take off. Um, once we get out there, we would transit, depending. Um, that And that transit time could take a few hours. And in the meantime, while we're doing that, we're getting set up for the mission. We're checking in with... Uh, who's called the mission on scene commander. That's another Intel person at another location. The U-2 is an intelligence surveillance reconnaissance aircraft. So I always say that we're the angels of the sky. We go out to a particular area, we surveil by taking imagery or we listen to signals and we get signals intelligence. So that, um, that means the electronic spectrum, that's comms, that's Right, because the this especially let's talk about Iraq asymmetric yes. threat insurgency. Yes, um, it's not like you're listening for a NATO code name, uh, you know, tracking Sam or or other things like that. You're 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 kind of in this other spectrum. It was kind of low low fi in terms of the technology. We go through a whole host of spectrums, right? We we take that information, we collect that information. We send it off board of our aircraft to a distributed ground station where you have analysts, you have people who are, who will dissect this information and provide it near real time to the end user. And the end user can be anyone from the troops in contact, the JTIC on the ground. It could be to another agency. It could be to um, feed in for what the next plan of attack is for the next day. So before going into this area that I'm going to be surveilling that day, uh, you check in, you get a, a final brief of what's going on. And then I reach out to people that I know that are specifically on the ground and say, hey, I'm checking in. Do you need anything? What do you got going on? Is there any way I can help you? You have a whole bunch of radios. You can hit them on FM. You can hit them on different comm frequencies. So you could talk directly to the end user in theater and find out what they need or what you could do to help them. And in the meantime, you're getting back information from the mission on scene commander based on the data that they're analyzing to tell you to feed them information, to have a communication relay to another area or to help aircraft to aircraft talk it. The other thing that we probably should have talked about earlier, but this is a single seat airplane. There are tandem seat versions, um, but you're, you're flying solo for all of these missions. Correct. So the tandem seat aircraft are for training purposes only. So it is a single seat, 
So we always say alone, unarmed, and unafraid, uh, just because of the altitude we fly, the physiological pressures that we are under constantly. I, I always tell people if if I'm flying a mission and I'm not taking care of my diet or I have some type of issue, like I can ruin the mission or I cannot, I won't be there to provide that information. And there's no other backup because once I take off, I take off. You can have maybe another aircraft in reserve, but it's, it's you out there get, you know, getting it done. In the beginning of the U-2, when it was spying solely on the Soviet Union back in the 60s, they, they flew a pretty strict line, right? So flying the black line, they would fly from point A to point B, point C, and then they would come back. What I, I liked about OEF and OIF is that we started to become more dynamic and were able to pivot on a dime based on the situation as it developed. I could say to the mock, hey, this is what's happening. And whatever information they were also getting, they could say, yes, we'd like you to go to this point and do this or X, Y, Z. Or like I talk about when I was in Iraq doing OIF towards the end of a mission, they're like, we need you to stay on station. We just had someone taken and we need you to do some search and rescue and, and, and do something. So we became more dynamic in that environment, which is what I enjoyed about the U-2. And the U-2, again, similar to the H-60, was a plug and play. So you had your sires that did electrical, optical, infrared type imagery. You had your ASAR system that did Doppler. Uh, we used that to do what was called Mazink collection. So basically traveling over one area and then going back over that area to see if there was disturbances in the ground, i.e. for a convoy that was about to approach. So maybe there was, if there was a disturbance in the ground, maybe someone put something there, maybe an IED or something. That's the type of information we can relay to those guys on the ground as they're moving and provide that type of information. Well, see, that's amazing because an airplane that was built for a very specific Cold War era mission morphs into something that can tackle the IED threat. We were very challenged uh, to deal with that asymmetric threat. And this is what a lot of the airplanes did. You know, this is where uh, the B-1 became a useful asset in that asymmetric environment. The Tomcat kind of flourished uh, because of Lantern uh, in that environment. So, you know, when you think of the U-2, you don't think about the post-9-11 conflicts. Um, and, and that's pretty amazing. So, you mentioned these are eight to 10 hour missions. So how often would you fly? Like once a day, every other day? What was your op tempo like? We're talking about you're operating for hours at Mount Everest altitudes. So it takes a toll on the body. And, I, and I'm not going to lie, you're exhausted when you come back. So typically once you land the next day, there are no flying duties for you. The following day, it is light duty. So you would do a mobile duty, soft duties, that's like tower duties. And so once every three days, we were eligible to fly. So typically our deployments were somewhere around 60 days due to the physiological stress on the body. You just needed time to decompress than what we're going to, because we were flying long missions. And I think that kind of played into the fact that a lot of my peers started developing some type of decompression, DCS type symptoms that were long lasting if they weren't contended with. And we, they actually, because we had so many incidences, they actually did some research and found out that most of us have brain lesions at, at those young ages that are not normal. Typically you find them at 60 or so. So I did part of that study and had about 20, but you know, it's, I can only explain it's like a, a type of fog over you and that if you're out of the YouTube for a while, it goes away. 60 day deployment, go home to Beale for how long before you went back for another 60 days? So usually it was about 60 days on, 60 days off. And how many U2s would you have in theater at any given time? I'll, I'll just give you the approximate. Um, we would have one in each theater daily rotating. The bench is not deep to do it's a not. very specific and important mission. Yes, it's not it's not deep, but and that's why we fly hard, and that's why you know when you're when you're flying this aircraft, um, you know there's a commitment that's required for it, and uh, some people are ready to make that commitment, other people are not. So that's why they do the interview process. When you talk about 
everything from man up to mission duration to the nature of the missions, you know, as a Tomcat guy, that's a really foreign cosmos to me, you know, um, because we, you know, you'd have upwards of 14 airplanes in a Tomcat squadron, um, seven on the flight deck. Uh, we do upwards of four plane events um, and always with a spare, you know. And then if we did a three hour mission, that was a long time, like a double cycle, three hour, you know. And sometimes we actually supported U2s during Operation Southern Watch when they would reflag the U2s into UN airplanes um, and, you know, supporting the whatever UN sanction number that was to monitor the movement of the Iraqis in those days south of the 33rd parallel. In, fi- in fact, it was kind of a challenge because we were afraid of MiG-25s bagging the U-2. And so we were there with our Phoenix missile trying to do the trigonometry to make sure we didn't you know, have a, a, an excursion above the 33rd parallel to prosecute the intercept. It was really quite a problem that we were trying to work with this U-2 going, as you said, three quarters of a Mach and us going Mach 1.5 and the MiG-25 going Mach 2.5, right? So do that, do that problem, right? So anyway, that's that's the, the, the sum total of what I know about the U-2. And so hearing you explain it, it it's, it's, a, it's an amazing um, and challenging world. So you leave that, you go to Palmdale and you're now on the test side of the house um, and you had a few more uh, tours of duty at NORAD and the Pentagon, and then you retired as a, a full colonel. After how many years did you serve? 23 years, four months, 20 days. But who's counting? But who's counting, yeah. <laughs> so the book is called Shattered of the Sky. The author is retired Air Force Colonel Merrill Tengestall. So Merrill, thank you for the time. Thank you for your 23 years plus of service. And uh, hope we get to meet in person very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And congratulations on all your success because you're doing the same thing. We are definitely uh, two alike. I would love to meet you on the East Coast. First round's on me, though. All right, well, I'm, I'm my call sign's Mooch, so I'm going to let you buy the first round. <laughs> oh, of, first course, round. of course, of course, of course. I look forward to that. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, click the button and ring the bell so you don't miss anything going forward. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarol. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.